Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Jaroslav Szymczak, I'm from OLX, and I'll give you a deep dive into XGBoost today. So let's start, and we'll start with some theory. And the roadmap of the theory looks like this. I'll first talk a little bit about a simple classifier decision tree. Then the decision tree makes two kinds of error, either the bias-related ones or the variance-related ones. And there are certain ensemble methods that allow you to compensate for these errors. And basically XGBoost is like a concatenation of them all and more. And that's the final stage of our theoretical journey to XGBoost. <laughs> Okay, so, very classical example from one of the machine learning books. You have some features describing the weather. And you'd like to know whether this weather is good to play tennis or no. And based on these features, with some classic algorithms that use certain measures like Gini index or entropy for information or gain ratio, you create the tree. And the tree is your classifier. It, of course, is a simple classifier and makes an error. And the sources of errors are twofold. You may overfit, for example, if you don't regularize your tree at all and you create something that is extremely specific to the data, you'll overfit a lot, which means that basically your model will not generalize well. For that, in classical decision trees, they introduced pruning. Or you can underfit, and actually it may be the case that the underlying data doesn't really fit the classifier that you chose, and it cannot be modeled at all with the classifier that you have. So you will constantly have this error regardless of, of how different hyperparameters you choose, for example, for this. But for both cases, using the same learner that would do this underfitting or overfitting, there are remedies in ensemble methods. So either you have ensemble methods that uh, compensate for overfitting or for underfitting. And let's start with the simpler case, with what can we do if we overfit. So Leo Breman came up with the idea of bootstrap aggregation. And bootstrap aggregation is a very simple concept to explain. You simply resample your training data that you have with replacement, which means that actually you don't need any parameters for that. You simply allocate the same number of slots as you have in your original data and you randomly pick the observations so it means that some observations can be doubled, tripled, and so on, and some observations will not be there at all. And thanks to this, um, when you train a lot of models on it, and your models overfit, each of them overfits in a different way. And when you average them, then your variance part of error should decrease. And if your model actually makes this variance-related errors, you will never go wrong with boosting, uh, sorry, with bagging. And uh, basically you will never go wrong with it in any case. You can just may waste some computational resources if your errors are not coming from variance. Then the same author also uh, invented random forest. And random forest has some additional component. Uh, it chooses the also, apart from randomness coming from bugging, so it, it is within the, same, within the same bugging framework, it also chooses randomly columns. And this trick is done in order to decorrelate the errors that are coming in different rounds that you make. So you make errors everywhere, but they have different origins. They, they're coming from, from differently created models, and hence, it, even, it is even uh, the, this re reduction of 
of variance is, uh, is more emphasized in such case. That was one part. Another part is, what if your model underfits? You have a very simple model and it cannot really like, reflect the complexity of your data. Like, let's take a look about, at this toy example of adaptive boosting. This method was invented by Robert Shafir from uh, Stanford University. And let's say that here we have two very simple classifiers. They can divide the space either vertically or horizontally. And if you look at this data, with neither you can really make a separation. So the way how to create something more complicated from it, which Adaboost does, is after each round, so it goes sequentially. It's like random forest or bugging could be done in parallel because things were not dependent on each other. Here you have rounds that one round depend on another round. So we st you start with an initial fitting of, of your model. You have some errors. Then you increase the weights of these things that you made error on and decrease the weights on the things that you classified correctly. You fit your model again, you repeat it for some number of rounds, and at the end, uh, based on the errors, training errors that you made on each of these rounds, you sum this to your final model, and in this toy example you can see that actually with this simple classifiers, we created something that is more complicated. But nowadays, much more used and much more known than adaptive boosting is gradient boosting. And the idea is quite similar. It's, uh, the easiest will be to actually uh, present it on a regression problem. When you have a regression problem and you fit some initial classifier or actually in many boosting algorithms nowadays you just start with a simple mean of, of all your data. You have errors coming from, from this fit. And actually, in every round of boosting, you try to compensate for these errors. So you, you're not learning the initial concept, you are learning the, the errors. So at the beginning, we have some initial residuals, we fit the model, then we take together the whole model, calculate the errors again, fit to the residuals, and so on and so on. And it just conveniently, totally coincidentally, happens that residuals are the gradient of root mean squared error function, uh, hence the gradient. Of course, the truth is that it's the other way around, but it was easier to, to explain. So basically, uh, for classification, you don't really have residuals, but you have a different loss function. For example, for logistic regression, you have logistic loss. And the gradient of logistic loss was not called any more residuals because these are not residuals. It's called pseudo, pseudo residuals. Uh, and that's what you fit. But basically, the idea is the same. So you fit on the errors and you correct with each round the error that that was made. And uh, it actually corresponds to running the gradient descent on your loss function. So, we approached XGBoost. XGBoost is just the most popular, I believe now, implementation of gradient boosting that wins a lot of Kaggle competitions and we also use it on production and we are happy with it. Uh, it has interfaces in Python, R, you can run it on Hadoop Yarn. Uh, it has some version for Java, now you can run it on GPU. There are many new functionalities that they implement. It's still under development. It's not an abandoned project by no means. So new, new features are, are introduced all the time. Uh, it can be used for classification, regression, learning to run, uh, to rank, and how it differs, for example, from scikit-learn gradient boosting machines. 
uh, it has a custom function to build the tree. Because of course boosting is a general framework. You can use any classifier inside, like for example linear regression or logistic regression and boost on top of it. But the most popular and most widely used are decision trees within the boosting framework. So as I mentioned um, at the beginning, when you create uh, the decision trees, normally you use some heuristic function about whether to, it's worth to make a split or not, and on which attribute to make the split. And in classical uh, setting, Gini index or um, entropy is used as, as such measure. And actually, XGBoost uh, requires the gradient and the Hessian of your loss function and the, the all, all the splitting and all the evaluations and everything is done on your loss function that you provided, but is actually regularized and we will talk about this in, in tuning of the parameters, but generally it doesn't use some one approximation for splitting and another for, ev for evaluating regarding certain um, objective that you have. It just uses this objective directly to create the trees. And that's one of the biggest differences in comparison with other methods that are used. Some handy things that XGBoost has, for example, you can see the progress of, of your boosting. You have the watch list, so you can pass your train and validation set and you see the progress every round or every number of rounds. I'll show you this exactly on, on some code examples, but this is very handy to see whether something happens or not, how fast is it going, and basically very handy for debugging, especially that for models where you have a large number of features and large number of values, it takes uh, quite a long time to train. Then, um, I will not cover this with code, but it, there is the possibility that you didn't use enough rounds of boosting and you still can improve. And normally well, you would need to start again, waste all these hours. In XGBoost you can start where you finished and continue. On the other hand, uh, if you overfitted and you used too many trees, at prediction time you can limit the number of the trees to use and even overfitted models are recoverable from, I'd say. And this I'll show you. Okay, so, so much for the theory. Um, let's go with some coding. If you take a look at the parameters, the field default ones, that's a scikit-learn wrapper for XGBoost classifier, and that's what we'll focus on in this coding section. It has certain default parameters, through the parameters actually, through all of them, will go in tuning section. So, for now, let's just use the default ones on some data set. As a, a toy data set, I chose 20 news groups data set from scikit-learn. Um, if you go through any example of text processing in scikit-learn, most likely this is the data set <laughs> that is used for it. Um, I am not using it in the optimal way because I wanted to have a certain number of features without getting exactly into what it is. For now we treat this as a black box. But as I actually run all these examples, and this is a converted Jupyter notebook, I also had some limited <laughs> time constraints not to use everything. Plus some things were changing in between, so that's the reason. Uh, what happens here? I take the train and the test in a classical split, how it's done in scikit-learn. Uh, then, with train test split, I want to have a separate validation set. So, on training set, we'll do actual training within the certain number of boosting rounds. And validation will be used at every time as a watch list to see how this error also behaves on this validation set. Plus, we have a classic test set that 
is from the original train test split. Uh, then TF-IDF vectorizer, a classic feature extraction from scikit-learn with some restrictions as I mentioned and you may be curious why these sparse matrices are converted at the end because normally scikit-learn gives you the matrices that are sparse row-wise and the problem is that uh, this XGBoost which is currently on, on PIP has a bug <laughs> and if your last feature in some of these um, data sets is missing you will get an error that uh, number of features is not right because it will not take it into account and also XGBoost internally it converts it to its own data structure that is also a data that is sparse by columns so here is just a conversion to, to column wise sparsity That's how the data looks like. As you see, it's uh, really sparse, two and a half percent density, um, two and a half uh, thousand features roughly. And we do some simple classification. Um, funny thing about verbose parameter, it can be true, false, or a number. So <laughs> if you give a number, it just gives you every 11th round. <laughs> which is really handy for making presentations. So they even thought about this. <laughs> then uh, in meetup description, I promise that I'll show you a couple of XGBoost features. One, it doesn't uh, really change the way how it classifies things if you do monotonic transformations. Second, features can be correlated and third, you can add some random noise and it will still be as good. Let's check if it's true. So first, uh, a linear transformation. As you know, TF-IDF stands for um, <laughs> term frequency inverse document frequency. And term frequencies are row based. So it's like you apply your count vectorizer, count the number of times certain words over and then divide by the length of the document. So that's row-wise, that's something that is not, it's, it wouldn't be a linear transformation, for example, if I used the count vectorizer. But here I say, it, please don't use inverse document frequency. And inverse document frequency is a feature of a certain word. As words are our features, it means that it's, now I actually make a linear monotonic transformation on each column just by not using the IDF. And as you see there are some slight changes but if you see at uh, around 33 this is exactly the same. So why it's not exactly the same all the time? Potentially because of floating point operations roundings and another thing is that uh, this wouldn't explain it for train set, but for validation, when you do the split, and the split is between two values, let's say it's four and five. So if it's four and five, the split would be under four and a half. But if, for example, uh, I would transform it with mono in monotonic way by squaring everything, uh, it would be nine and 25, and then split would not be um, in four and a half squared. So that's another reason. But still, this is very, very similar. Um, now, as I mentioned, count vectorizer will be different, but these are the news groups data. So people sending emails to certain news groups. I would expect that the length is more or less similar. So these features will be correlated with a uh, term frequency. So we use both. We do H stack of sparse matrices. We use both and the results are roughly the same again. So the only problem here may be when you analyze the importance of the features because sometimes one feature will be used, another time another feature will be used and you can underrate the importance of certain features because, because of it. Then I add some random matrix 
that has exactly the same density as our initial one and actually it has two times more columns than the initial matrix. So the resulting matrix has one third of the columns that mean something and two thirds of the columns that are total randomness just with this similar sparsity. And the result is slightly worse but it's still inconclusive that it's not immune to, to noise entirely because actually if you try to change the random seed you will also have differences because there, are, there is some randomness in this algorithm so you would have differences as well. Now, some features. Watch lists I already shown you. Early stopping, a really cool one. So when you have watch list, of course, what you can use it for is to determine when you should stop. It's one of the first questions when you ask yourself, okay, we go with these rounds, how long? For example, as long as you have improvements on your validation set, and that's what early stopping is for. And then you can also have, when you fit the classifier, you have the whole history, like the, whatever you want to track, you can add whatever measures you want, whatever sets you want, and it shows you exactly what was the history uh, of learning. Here is the example of early stopping. It has also some nice debugging um, info saying you that oh, it actually it's just the second pair that it will be used for early stopping. And that's quite important. So for example, here I passed train and validation. Validation is the second one. Good, validation will be used for early stopping, not the train, because it would make no sense. Train would almost always improve. You want to find this time when they start to diverge. And uh, in the almost last line, the one before, you have the example that I promised. You set a tree limit in prediction. And we set this truly tree limit to be the, the tree limit that was had the best evaluation and validation. So a couple of hyper parameters are solved with watch lists. Then some easy way to see the, how the learning curve looks like. It's the classic one and that's the, from the example just before. So actually after that, what you see here there is no more improvement. It doesn't go up. There will be one uh, case when I'll show you a plot depending on some parameters when actually this goes up, but normally for the very long time there will be no improvement until it actually starts to go up. So you will not observe it um, unless you don't run it for really too long. Okay, so now we'll do some tuning. <coughs> and the best setting for tuning and actually determining which parameters are better than the others would be to make three times tenfold cross validation with different seeds and a holdout set just to ensure that you didn't overfit your cross validation. So I'm just saying you that, but actually we did it much simpler here. We just, uh, I just uh, have the original splits and uh, you cannot treat everything that you'll see as uh, something that can be generalized for um, other settings than what we see here. So this is the setting for this particular problem, for this particular feature, and also the features will be analyzed one dimensionally which in actually, uh, when you do the training, you should take into account all of them because uh, the optimal values of the features depend on the other features. So it's like actually a multi-dimensional problem. You cannot do it one dimension normally, but just to have some glimpse how things look like, treat it as like that. So, some general parameters that you have. The most important ones is the max depth of your tree, which actually corresponds into how many interactions you allow to model in your tree. If the max depth is 5, it means that you can model 
interaction of up to five variables together. And also the difference between depth 5 and depth 6 in potential number of leaves of the tree is like with every level it doubles. So also the complexity of the algorithm doubles, the time of execution doubles and more or less, of course, sometimes regularization prevents it, but you need to be ready for this pessimistic scenario of it. Each level makes it double. And that's the main complexity, complexity parameter. Then, um, when I was talking how uh, one round after another you have feather algorithms, sorry, feather um, models <coughs> that correct each other, that's not entirely true because uh, you shrink it. You don't want the whole model to override everything. You just multiply it by some constant and then it just goes a little bit into the direction of correcting these errors. And then you train again and this shrinkage parameter actually when you have the gradient descent you prevent jumping from one hill to another basically. If We'll see how, how this affects learning, uh, both parameters I'll show you. Then max delta step, uh, this parameter is rarely used, it's only usable for very very highly imbalanced classes in binary uh, setting. Actually how XGBoost handles multiple, um, multiple classes classification is that it has one versus all scheme. So it just creates a lot of binary classifiers. So basically if any of it is highly imbalanced, these initial steps may be very high even if you have small learning rate. Because the actual weights in the leaves uh, will depend on the Hessian and Hessian can be very small in such case which would cause to explosion in weights and this is a cup only for this particular problem so most likely unless you have extremely imbalanced data sets you will not touch this parameter then number of parameter number of estimators which is basically number of boosting rounds you can choose the booster, it doesn't have to be three, but I already mentioned that most of the time we use trees. Then there is some possibility to scale the weights of positive and negative samples. We can also alter the base score. As I mentioned in this first round, we don't, we, we never, with XGBoost, we never fit at the original uh, data, the original score. There is some baseline for regression, it would be like a mean of all the values and for classification 0 0.5 so we are totally unsure where to classify this binary problem. Then uh, very often you are required to do something that is reproducible. So you want your code to, when you run it again, you want the same results. So in order to do this, of course, it's a common case that you need to set the seed, but it's not enough. So when XGBoost is in multi-threaded setting, it will not be um, reproducible. Plus there is some unfortunate combination of software and hardware that I managed to encounter uh, some time ago that actually even with single threaded and uh, seed set um, it still is not reproducible and when I found the explanation they claimed that it could be because of floating point arithmetics. So, but in most architectures and software if you set it to one thread and set the seed you'll be fine. What to treat as missing? Normally would be not a number but if you just read some data prepared by someone else and they denoted minus one as missing, you can just alter it here rather than pre-process the data. And then you can have a custom objective. So for regression default one would be root mean squared error, for classification it would be log loss. But basically if you want to use something else and it is differentiable to the second degree, you just provide the callable that gives the gradient and the Hessian and you're good to go. 
Just if you implement this in Python, this should be much slower because the original version is in C++ and the data is transferred only once. If it actually would call all the time the, the function um, from Python, it definitely would be slower. So, the parameters that we've seen so far, apart from max depth, you will not really tune. Normally, like this learning rate, you'll set to something sensible. The rest of them are dependable on your data. You don't really tune this, you don't set um, 5 or 10 or 100 parameters and let's check how it will behave with them because these are more likely and most like a settings rather than tuning things. But um, for max depth, let's see how this characteristic would look like uh, on our problem. Actually, the plot will be nicer. So as you see, we overfit quite hard. Um, basically, like three is enough, almost, maybe five. And then the trees that are deeper are the waste of resources, basically. So you are not hurt, as you see, this doesn't go up. But still, there is no point. But in case of learning rate, you are hurt and it goes up. So you need to be careful. And also one remark from this plot, it would seem that like 0, 2 is the optimal one. Not necessarily, because we have the fixed number of boosting rounds here. And it's normal that with, it's like, it's really like a speed of learning. So 0, 1 speed will eventually also get there. Just it requires more number of rounds. Um, but 0, 4 and 0, 6 and so on will raise with, with time. So you definitely should not use it for this problem. You can make a plot like this, find something sensible. Default one is 0, 1, basically. But very often uh, in, in some competitions, uh, you may want to even have a, a smaller learning rate like 0, 0, 0,05 and so on, because when, when this decimal places of, of log loss matters, then maybe it will be worth it. Now the explanation why I was talking about random forests, bugging and everything, because this maybe could be a little bit confusing for you, but actually these parameters are something that act similarly. So subsample could be an analogy with resampling from bugging. So you set a certain fraction and every round only this fraction of data is taken into account and it may really help you with dealing with some nasty outliers that you have and that drag your perfect score away. So basically after each round these outliers have a chance not to end up in your training set and that's how you can deal with it. Then call sample by tree. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned it is in random forest it was important to decorrelate this. In boosting there is no necessity for decorrelation because you don't fit um, your models or your algorithms on the same data. However, it is still handy sometimes. And call sample by, th by, by tree or by level. Uh, how would it differ? By tree means that at the very beginning you just give a certain number of features and classifier can be built only with these features. By level means that on each level a different features are available to you, which means that if you have some feature that is really dominant and it's always in the root of the tree, when you use this parameter, sometimes you can push it lower, for example, because it will not be available at the creation of root split, but it will be available most likely forever. So, how they affect our data set? Subsample, uh, I in, in, intentionally took this learning rate 1.0 to see if we can deal with this overfitting, nasty overfitting that we've seen. And unfortunately, well, in this particular case, subsampling doesn't help. So actually, as we go through the full data set, our, um, all the errors shrink in this particular case. But of course, it depends on everything, on your settings, on your data set. So when you tune, as I mentioned, it's really a multidimensional problem. 
but here as a toy examples we analyze one dimension at a time. Then call sample by tree. It doesn't improve things, but from 0 to 6 you see that actually these errors don't really change and the number of runs is fixed. So basically it, at least it uh, saves you some computational resources because the more columns you have that was the whole reason why I didn't take the whole TFID of vectorized stuff because it was calculating too long for such a toy presentation. And then call sample by level, similar case. Because when you have these small changes, just as a homework, check your random seed and assign random seed from 1 to 100, see how things behave. You also have differences. So some differences are just random. Now the regularization part. So actually that's the formulation of the, of the objective for the boosting. You have the loss function and the sum is across all observations. So for example in case of regression this will be our residuals. And then you have the sum over all trees that you've built so far of the penalty regarding certain attributes of these trees. So basically you penalize the complexity of your tree somehow. The important part here is that you cannot change the past, which means that even though it's sum over all the trees, the previous trees are fixed. So you actually optimize only the current tree that you built. And uh, the formula from the paper looks like this, which means that we have this gamma here, gamma t. t is the number of leaves and gamma is just some number that you can choose from 0 to infinity. As you see, it is loss function plus regularization function, which for example means that depending on what type of loss function you have, the gamma will have to be different, even totally different magnitude. What is more? It is the number of leaves. Number of leaves depends on the maximum depth of the tree that you have. So if you test it, for, uh, try to find an optimal value for your parameters, well, then on each maximum depth, this value will be totally different. This is also another thing to take into account. And it just takes into account the number of leaves, because in each leaf you have some weights. And the penalty for this weight is here lambda. And basically this is something very similar that you may know from ridge regression. So it's L2 norm. What is not written here in this objective in the paper but is actually available is also L1 lasso regularization. So basically also gamma is sometimes called L0 regularization. So you have all these parameters to um, hold the complexity of your tree. Interesting parameter is minimum child weight. Um, in, classic, in classic algorithms that you have for building the trees, uh, you have some minimum number of observations that need to be uh, in some node to make a split. Here it's the sum of weights, but actually some, sorry, some of Hessians. And as I mentioned, Hessians for um, linear regression will be 1, which is basically the same as in this classical settings. However, Hessian for, uh, I actually checked the code, this is line from C++, where Hessian for log loss is used. So basically this is the sum of these weights. And it's um, value of prediction times 1.0 minus value of prediction, which has a maximum of quickly counting, 0 0.25. So 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. If you're for the more sure your prediction, the smaller the value is. So you have a roughly, you also probably wouldn't actually tune for minimum child weight because it is constant. That's how it differs from gamma. That when you have a certain path, this path will result in certain sum of weights there, always, regardless of um, other parameters that you have, 
So you can actually come up with this. For regression, it's super simple. I want to have at least three observations to make a split. I just set it to three. And gamma very much depends, as I mentioned, on the whole structure of your tree because it's the number of leaves. So you need to experiment with everything, even with magnitude. You can like start your searching for a good parameter with 0, 1, 10, 100. 100 would be actually very good, very high. Oh, that's what I just mentioned. And last part, why feature, impo feature importance is very, very significant thing. So what are the most important features? It's quite small, I will read to you. You, this, have, on, with, be, not, are, if, or. So basically, we just make the classifier on stop words and it still works quite well. Uh, that's why I argue that it's really important to actually not only tune your stuff with some hyperparameters and validation and so on, because we did this, and still look what kind of features were significant. There, there are certain... Uh, You, we would need to go deeper into this. It may be because of the way how uh, I restricted the TF-IDF vectorizer. It wasn't intended actually that these features would be used, but we have a nice le lesson learned that you really need to analyze your features. And also, well, scikit-learn doesn't very much encourage you when you create the pipelines to preserve exactly what features went where. But you can do some tricks to still get get them and know exactly what are the final features from where they come from and see if they are sensible because very often you can create even a quite a good classifier but uh, I had a story when we took um, the magnetic resonance um, images and there was a signal coming from the cerebral fluid and it was one of the most important features that we had and then We consulted with the medical guy and he said that it's basically like it doesn't have a signal normally. It's just what's like magnetic field of earth. So it was totally insignificant and that's how we debug that we have a problem there. So it's very important. Um, one important thing from here with uh, XGBoost uh, based on trees you cannot extrapolate. So. If you have in train, for example, maximum price of something is $1,500 and then in test there will be 15 million, it will just treat it in the same way as this 1500 So that's, that's the big drawback. It, it doesn't extrapolate. Some things about bugs, but we are out of time. Um, I created this presentation with this project, Jupiter to Slides. It's uh, the project of the fellow Berliner, Dat Tran, and I really enjoyed doing it, so I recommend you to take a look. And there is a link to GitHub repo and to the paper of XGBoost. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to answer your questions.